Welcome on this damp, cool day. Great to be in the house of the Lord, though, regardless of what's going on outside. So, welcome all. Uh, don't think I have any announcements of anything today. Anybody else know of anything needs to... So, notice in the front how beautifully that Ted has gotten the cross lit along with the windows that go with it. And he's been working on it for a while, and he's got it looking great. And Ross, too, I understand. So, hey, the dynamic duo. <laughs> uh, this place wouldn't look nearly like it does if it wasn't for these two, so we still appreciate them. So, anything else? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this chance to be here in safety, in comfort, in uh, joyful fellowship together. Just bless our day. Open our hearts to what you have for each of us today as we share in the word, as we listen to what your guidance is for each of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let us now be called to worship responsively. Jesus Christ, the great physician, invites us into the healing presence of God, our refuge. God knew us before we were born and summoned us to service in our youth. God, our rock and fortress, rescues us from injustice, cruelty, and wickedness. God touches our lips and puts words in our mouths. God commands us to speak and removes our fears. God, our hope and trust, meets us where we are and leads us to times of witness and praise. God's revelation comes in unexpected places to meet our needs and empower our service. Let us worship our wonderful Lord now in song. You'll find our hymn of praise today, page 26 in your hymnals, a mighty fortress is our God. Join as we sing all four verses, a mighty fortress. Did we in our own strength come 
may be seated. Amen. Let us now be called to confession. We who take for granted the abundance and freedom we enjoy are summoned to recognize the sovereignty and generosity of God. We who are blind to the mystery of God's presence among us and insistent on our own way are brought face to face with love and here recognize our sin. Let us seek the forgiveness of God. Would you share with me in our prayer of confession? O oh God, we have been noisy gongs and clanging cymbals, impressed with our own knowledge and misled by childish reasoning. We have mistaken our hazy insights for your truth and have resented others for whom your love is life-changing. Forgive not only our arrogance, gracious God, but also our timidity. Equip us for an authentic witness to your love. Amen. Hear the good words of our Lord. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God says to us, do not be afraid, for I am with you to deliver you. God rescues us from wickedness, injustice, and cruelty. With God's help, we can leave childish ways behind. Because we're understood by God, we can grow in understanding. So faith, hope, and love abide in you, and love is the greatest of all God's gifts. Let us celebrate our forgiveness now by singing the Gloria Patri. You'll find that on page 623 in your hymnals. The Gloria Patri, please stand and remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to share with me in the Apostles' Creed. 
It is found under the Affirmations of Faith and toward the back of your hymnal, item number 716. Church, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Time for our prayer concerns this morning. Um, continue to pray for Terry and Tammy. I think Tammy is getting better. I'm not uh, exactly sure what the final results are, but uh, Terry is still struggling with his neck and um, uh, the healing process there. And back and forth to the hospital this week, I don't think has helped his situation. So be praying for both of them. Um, Ola Siva, remember that name, O-L-E-S-E-V-Y-A, a teenage Russian girl who has been sentenced to a long prison term for a critical post on, on the social media um, about the war, the Russian war. And she is going to prison as a result. Be praying for her, will you? There's no telling what she will go through uh, if she ever gets out. And next time you want to fuss and criticize what's going on in our own country, remember what it's like other places. We are very, still very fortunate. So, any other prayer concerns this morning? Bill? Rayburn, yeah, Ron Rayburn, his uh, cancer has returned, uh, different kind of cancer, but uh, so Ron Rayburn, please pray for pray for him. Uh, other concerns this morning? Uh, yes, Harry, we have a good friend. I think Phil has mentioned this before. Uh, our, our college friend Fred Van, his wife Debbie, is still in the hospital at Georgetown. She, uh, they're not real sure exactly. It's a result from COVID. And she uh, is still, the last I heard a couple of days ago, she's still unconscious on a ventilator. Her name is Debbie Van, V-A-N-N. -N. You praying for your friend Debbie, who's in pretty serious condition right now. Other. We have completed three steps in the process of going from Louisville to Bridgeport. They found a rental house. They got. They transported all the animals. That's four rats <laughs> and two cats. And Saturday, uh, Friday, the their house in Louisville was put on the market. So, pray that it sells for a good price and they can find something they can rent. There you go. So. 
Karen and Jeff's family is re relocating to Alabama, so uh, most of us. Wow. So uh, be praying for Karen's family. That mo those of us who have moved along in our lifetime, we uh, we know what joy that is. So <laughs> be praying for them. Other things? Pastor? Let us go to the Lord then together with all of these needs. Uh, Father, we are so grateful that you love us and that we can come to you with whatever concerns we have in our lives and we can know that you hear us. We're so grateful for that because we know that you're not only the mighty God who made us, but that you're also the loving Savior who gave your life for us. And so we're so grateful for that, Lord, because we know that not only do you hear our prayers, but you are touched by our infirmities. And so we pray that indeed you will bless these who have been mentioned. I pray that you will grant to them your gifts of grace and peace. And I pray that you will stretch forth your healing hand of mercy to them. I pray, Lord, that whether it be calamity or illness or whatever may have happened in our lives that has disturbed us or has caused us worry or concern or anxiety, that we can cast it all upon you now and we can know that we are loved and that you are working in our lives and bringing about good. We thank you for that, Father. For we are bold to pray the prayer that you, our Master, have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In this imperfect world, God entrusts love to us and bids us share it in practical and helpful ways. Our offerings are one response we make to the love of God poured out in Jesus Christ. We pass on that love in word and deed as we commit our gifts to God's purposes. Please stand for the doxology.
you. You all may be seated. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you, Lois, for that lovely song. I, I never hear that, that it, I do not just get touched in a very amazing way. Uh, if you don't know that song, it's called In the Presence of Jehovah. And when she just starts playing it, you can just, I don't know, I just feel it's love washing all over me. And it just, it's exciting. And thank you, Lois, for being here today. You're a blessing to us. And uh, we always look forward to it. Not that we look forward to having Jack not with us, if you're listening, Jack. <laughs> but we also enjoy ha having you, and it's such a delight. So I want to invite you to turn with me to Micah. And uh, Micah is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. You know, that's a, de a designation by man. God doesn't call people minor prophets and major prophets, you know. That's our own way of doing it. I, I was asked one time by a preacher, am I a minor prophet or a major prophet? <laughs> And, and I said, I think that's up to the Lord to decide that one. Uh, so uh, Micah, we're going to read chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And then I'm going to ask you to just have a Bible study with me this morning. We're going to go through the, hopefully... I know this is a bold task, and I promise you that if you don't endure through it, I will cut it off. But uh, we're going to try to get through the whole book of Micah. We're not going to read every verse, but we're going to try to hit some highlights. But anyway, let's, let's begin. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? Micah 6, 6. And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good? And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If there's a God and I know there is, then the most important question we will ask ourselves and the root of all other questions is, do I please him? More important than the questions of social concerns that are most valuable and also important, very important and very meaningful. Questions like, do I please my family? Well, most of the time. Or more specifically, do I please my spouse or my children or uh, my parents? Uh, in this case, my parents are in heaven, but uh, some of you um, may still have, uh, well, I guess not. <laughs> They're all in heaven too, praise the Lord, you know. Well, anyway, uh, so, or how about our friends? We want to please our friends, don't we? Of course we do. You know, we want to please our friends because as one pundit has observed, you need at least six. And I will explain that in a moment. In somewhat agreement, the aging single unmarried uh, spinstress was very specific in her will that only women would be pallbearers. She said, no man would take me out while I was alive. I'll be bleep if I'll let six take me out when I'm dead. <clears throat> Notice, I refer to this person not as an old man. 
Old Maid is a card game we played as children. Can I get a witness? <laughs> but it is somewhat derogatory and certainly not PC. I was taught as a young preacher by a mentor who had a great sense of humor. He said, son, don't ever call a woman an old maid. Refer to her as an unclaimed blessing. And I like that. You know, now, uh, does that please everyone? Because I, it's really important to me to please you, my dear extended forever family, because as my brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you, and I believe that feeling is mutual. I believe you love us as well. Now, what person would not want to please someone that you love? You know, at times through the years, I've been accused in my ministry of being a man pleaser rather than a what? God pleaser? But usually the ones that made those accusations and they were folks that had accepted a calling in life to please no one but God. And uh, I think you've probably run into a few of those before, you know. So I, that's all I'll say about that. So it, it, their philosophy was if I was being liked by too many in the church, then I must not be pleasing God. Well, I think there's a balance, and I think that, but our biggest concern should not be are we pleasing just people, but isn't the essence of the major question in life, am I pleasing God? So let's all be honest. If we have a reasonably mature attitude about life, we don't want to be a circle of one. You call that person a narcissistic sociopath who at best becomes an I-land to himself or herself or itself. A paranoid, a hermit, a loner, or at worst, a mass murderer, or at least a danger and threat to those who would join hands across races, aisles, cultures, nations. An enemy to those of us who love and look for friendship, court collegiality, and buddies and pals, good neighbors, uncles and aunts who are not kin to us, but are very dear to us nonetheless. But before we can cross the aisle or reach out to those that we feel are different from us, before we can even dare to attempt to please others, much less ourselves, we must ask that ever-haunting, daunting question, do I please God? Now, this was a question that must have troubled Micah. Micah was a prophet to Judah in the 8th century B.C. He ministered during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, are roughly between 737 B.C. and 696 B.C., a period of about 40 years. Now, Micah is perhaps best known for his Christmas prophecy. You remember when the Magi came, they said, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? And, uh, and then Herod sent his scribes to the scrolls, and they came back and said that Micah, 5.2 says that he will be born in Bethlehem. Well, Micah is more than just a one prophecy wonder. He is called to be a preacher and prophet, and he joined his contemporary prophetic uh, friends, Isaiah, Amos, and Hosea, in prophesying judgment on Israel first, and then on Judah and on Jerusalem. Micah, whose name means, who is like God. What a great name. Uh, felt that his mission was to preach against the evil of his day and to warn Judah that they were soon to be judged and would be taken into captivity and to encourage the Jews to understand this captivity would be not permanent but that they would, some of them, a remnant of them, would return to Israel. 
Now he does all this through seven chapters. But this morning I want us to hear his revolutionary teaching about the marks of a man or a woman that please God. So we're not going to have time to hit it all, but we're going to try to hit some of the, the high points. I want you to think with me, grouping our thoughts around three things this morning that Micah addresses that are themes. Terrible times, truthful prophecies, and triumphant grace. See if you don't see these themes popping up in the scripture as we go through it. You know, as God's people, we may have to live through terrible times. And the history of the church is no different than the history of Israel when it came to dealing with terrible times. Let's look at Micah, as I said, so I don't want you to close your Bible, but... Uh, Turn there in Micah, the first chapter and the second verse, and you will see that Micah has a controversy with the nation of Judah. Hear you peoples, nations, all of you, listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness that against you, the Lord from his holy temple, Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and he treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. In other words, the city will be razed. Or a Z E D. Her idols will be broken to pieces. Her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. The prophet then says, I will wail and howl. Howl. I will go stripped and naked. Well, that's one thing I won't be doing to imitate the prophet this morning. But he said, and that word means barefooted and naked, I will make a wailing like the jackals and mourning as the owls. For her disease, her wound is incurable, for it has spread from Samaria to Judah. It has reached the very gate of my people, even to Jerusalem itself. Well, what has Israel and Judah done. Well, you remember the separation hundreds of years earlier when Rehoboam, Solomon's son, became king of Israel. Uh, he listened to his advisors. His young advisors said, put more taxes, more burdens on the people. And so they did. And the people revolted. And they appointed Jeroboam the king of Israel. So now there were two kings of Israel and the kingdom was divided. Ten of the tribes of Israel were the northern kingdom or Samaria and two made up the southern kingdom or Judah along with the other tribe, Benjamin. Then in 722, Assyria conquered Samaria. And they tried to also conquer and occupy Jerusalem, but they ran into a slight problem. It was called the angel of the Lord. I invite you to read that wonderful story because Sennacherib decided he would, uh, since he did so well with the northern kingdom, he would just go right on down and take over Jerusalem and Judah. But God had other plans. And so he sent his angel 
to minister to the uh, Assyrians that evening. And my friends, you don't want that kind of ministry because when that angel had finished, 185,000 of them lay dead. And so Sennacherib said, I think I'll go with plan B. And he turned around and he left Jerusalem. But Samaria turned to idols and began to mix their beliefs because you see the Assyrians, their philosophy of taking over a nation was not to conquer it like Babylon did and then take the best back to their nation to train them in their ways. They settled in with the people. And so therefore their beliefs and faith and social customs became accepted by the Samaritans and basically they adulterated the Jewish faith there of the Samaritans. Now Micah 116, he prophesied that, it, that Judah would be taken into captivity. And 116 he says, shave your head in mourning for the children in whom you delight Make yourself bald as the vulture, for they will go from you into exile. And that was a way of mourning, was to shave their heads. Micah saw the coming defeat and destruction of Judah by the Babylonians. And indeed, it occurred in 586, 587 B.C., somewhere in that time frame. And unlike the Assyrians who occupied the land, the Babylonians took the people, the best, into captivity. Now, let's look at some of the accusations that Micah mentions against Judah. And, uh, you know, it says, verse 1 of the second chapter, you plot evil in your dreams and do it when you are awake. You covet fields and seize them. You defraud people of their homes. You rob people of their inheritance. Anybody answered a phone recently? We have people all over the world that will be only too glad to relieve you of the burden of your money. And believe it or not, the title thing, I don't know if it's true or not, but they claim that people can steal your property. Because what they'll do is they'll get your title information and then they will assess like a home equity loan against the property and then not pay it back, of course, because they have it. And then when you get a, a letter from the bank saying we're taking over your property. Hmm. Well, I guess the reason I wanted to tell you this about Micah, brothers and sisters, is because I think that we are living in some of those days today. Uh, I am planning disaster, God said to Micah, against this people. You cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly it will be a time of calamity. And then in chapter 2, verse 6, your prophets say disgrace will not overtake us. You know, God bless America. And I believe that, and I pray he shall. But I have a feeling that we are going to have to come to a time of great repentance before those blessings are really outpoured. And then verse 11, they prophesy for plenty of wine and beer. I've known some prophets like that before. That's not my uh, accusation at the Legion where I'm a member, but uh, anyway, destruction and death and servitude are guaranteed by Micah. But he also holds out a silver lining for the great dark cloud that is soon to come over Judah. In chapter 2, verse 13, he says, The promise of a remnant and a return will be led by God as their shepherd. 
And in chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Then shall they cry out to the Lord, but he will not hear them. Talking about the people when they have all these problems. Uh, and the seers will be shamed because they won't see anything. The prophets. Every, God is going to make it so that everything about this vision, whatever sixth sense they seem to have, well, they will not be able to see anything. Everything will be dark to them. And in chapter 3, verse 12, Zion shall be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, heaps of rubble. But here's some promises. I'm not going to just stand up here and tell you all the bad news. I want to tell you the good news, too. In chapter 4, verse 1, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And get this. This is one of my favorite parts. Verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against a nation Neither shall they learn war anymore. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. But, verse 4, they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Moving on to chapter 5. God describes in chapter 5 to uh, Micah how he's going to do it. He said in verse 10, I will destroy your horses and demolish your chariots. That's how he's going to destroy Assyria. In verse 11, I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down your strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft and you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your idols and your sacred stones from among you. You will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will take vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations that have not obeyed me. I told you I'd go through chapter 5 pretty quickly. Chapter 6, Micah says that the Lord asked him to plead God's case. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. It's God saying to the prophet, please tell me, what did I do that was such a burden to you? How was I mean to you? I brought you up out of Egypt. I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and Aaron and Miriam when Balaam was hired by Balak, king of Moab, to curse you. I made him bless you instead. And in verse 6, Micah asked, How shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves, a year old. Apparently, Micah had a, a troubling feeling in his soul. Am I pleasing God? How can I do what pleases him? Does he require a sacrifice? Well, then what kind if he requires a sacrifice? And then is it enough that it is a one year old uh, ram or goat or? A bull? Is that enough? Uh, how much sacrifice should I make? When will I ever do enough? Bring enough. Even Abraham 
was prepared to offer his son Isaac. Should I give the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Isaiah 1, 11 through 12, one of the contemporaries of Micah says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. Well, then what then is the sacrifice that God wants from us? King David learned in Psalm 51, 16 through 17, for you desire not sacrifice, else I would give it. You delight not in burnt offerings, for the sacrifices of God, those things that are acceptable to him, are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall, and I said, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Would this extreme offering please God? No. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. And what is that? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Is that all? That's great. I can do that, right? Check that box. But can we? Do we do justice all the time? God's scorecard demands 100%. Be you perfect as I am perfect. Are we always merciful? Do we always walk humbly with God or are there times we find ourselves out of fellowship with Him? That word there that is used in the Hebrew is, is actually two separate words that are used for it, the word require. One is used in Deuteronomy 10, 12 when it says, And now Israel, what does the Lord require of thee? And that word means ask of thee. But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to love him and to serve him, with all thy heart and soul, and to keep his commandments. So, in other words, that is what, in Deuteronomy, the writer is saying God requires of thee, or requires of you. And in this context, that word that he uses in Hebrew is a word that means ask. He asks this of you. But... In the passage we just read, in Micah 6, 8, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God is a requirement that is not an ask. It is a demand. God demands justice. God demands mercy. And God demands that we walk humbly with him. Can anybody walk proudly with him? That is one of the things, the seven things that God hates is a proud look. But now more judgment on Israel for just a moment. Here they are in the sixth chapter, moving on to verse 11. They have wicked scales. They have deceitful weights. They have a bag of weights they carry around with them to adjust their scale. Rich men are full of violence. The inhabitants of the city speak lies. In chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Their tongue is deceitful. I will make them sick and desolate. 
You shall eat, but you shall not be satisfied. You shall always be hungry. Well, I can relate to that sometimes. Oh, what you carry will not save you. What you do rescue, I will surrender to the sword. And you will sow, but not reap. You will tread the olives, but not anoint yourself with olive oil. You will bear the reproach of my people, is what God said to the nation of Judah. In chapter 7, and we're going to wrap it up, the best days are behind us. The faithful have perished. There is none upright. They all lie in wait for blood. They, every man hunts his own brother with a net. Sounds like a lovely time to be alive, doesn't it? Unfortunately, I was just reading the newspaper. They do evil with both hands. I love the way the prophet says that. They're not satisfied with just doing evil with one hand. They do evil with both hands. They're like a two-fisted drinker, you know. They have, to, they have to use both hands to do their evil. They can't do enough evil unless they just do it with both hands. And the prince asks for gifts, and the judge seeks a bribe. Hmm, really? I'm just amazed that we have judges that have the sense enough to ask for that. I hope y'all didn't see the, uh, maybe you did. The, the, the last person that put up as a nominee for the district courts, and she was asked, tell us what you know about the fifth article of the Constitution. He said, uh, Kennedy asked this, the, the, the uh, Louisiana senator, he said, uh, does anything come to mind? And she said, no. He said, well, how about the second article? And, he, and she said, no. And I think he even went on down to the third. This is a justice who may be accepted, who stands in line to one day be on the Supreme Court. And we wonder why we have problems in our legal system. Aside from the fact that George Soros spent $40 million to get his people elected that have promised basically to be completely liberal and not prosecute crime. Don't give me on my stump. I'm getting warmed up. The judge seeks a bride. The great man utters his desires. I love the way the King James puts it. The great man or the rich man speaks his desires in court and they wrap it up. That's what the King James says. I was expecting, and then they wrap it up or something. But they wrap it up. They just say, oh, nothing to see here now, folks. Let's go home. Justice has been done. The best justice money can buy. Today, I guarantee you, if you ever get into a court fight, you don't have to. It's like a poker game. The guy wins who has the most money. Because after a while, the person that doesn't have any more money says, I have no more money. Oh, well, sorry. The best of men are as a briar, verse 4, chapter 7. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. Ouch. And the day of the watchman and your visitation comes. The day you post your watchman, your punishment will arrive. And then you will be confused. What do I do now? You'll say, should I look to friendly alliances for deliverance? Did you know who Israel looked to 
to protect them from the Syrians and the Babylonians? Hold on to your hats. This might blow it in the creek. Egypt. Egypt was one of their allies. And Egypt loved Israel now that they were up there and they had, because they were keeping their flank covered. They knew that they would have to be invaded before they would try to come down to Egypt. But Micah says, don't trust in a friend. Put no confidence in a guide. Verse 5, chapter 7. Don't even tell your thoughts or feelings to your spouse. What a terrible time. My confident is my bride. She knows me warts and all, but like Jesus loves me unconditionally because we have love for each other that comes from God. It's called agape. For the son dishonors the father, verse 6, and the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are the men of his own house. So listen to the prophet's solution to find peace and resolution in this chaos of broken relationships. Therefore, I, Micah writes, will look to the Lord. That's what we must do. When the times are bad, we don't just suck it up and say tough times may come, but tough people last, you know. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. No, we will look to the Lord. We will pray. And we will wait for the God of our salvation to answer our prayers. And our God will hear us. Micah said, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. And Micah is reminding us that they will never be able to gloat over us, our enemies, because evil can never rejoice over the righteous. This and we're done. When we fall, we will rise either temporarily or eternally. And when we are made to sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to us. And the indignation, the chastening, we will be able to bear because we know the discipline and punishment is deserved and we will accept his correction. And we will not forever sit in the darkness of God's displeasure because we know Christ intercedes for us. And he will bring us out of the darkness into the light so that we may see his righteousness. We know our sin is great, but God's power to redeem is greater. Who is a God like unto thee, Micah says, that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever, because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. All we have to do is live justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. But I'm going to be honest. I struggle with that. I need a Savior who can be there for me, who can say all my imperfections, all my sin all my failings, all my shortcomings, I lay at his mercy seat. I lay on him. And I thank him for dying on the cross for my sins. Jesus said, when the people said, what must we do to be saved? He said, believe in the one whom God has sent. 
Have you done that? If you've done that, no matter how bad times get, I can promise you God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And even in the darkness, He will be a light. Let us now stand and sing our hymn of decision and dedication. Our closing hymn today, you'll find on page 410 in your hymnals, it's My Faith Looks Up to Thee. This is an actual prayer. This is a corporate prayer that we can be singing to the Lord. My faith, our faith looks up to you, Lord. My faith is in King James English, but we know we are praying to God. Let's sing this prayer together this morning. My faith looks up to thee. <clears throat> Receive the benediction. Lord, send us forth into this world now as your ambassadors of grace, mercy, and peace, as your agents of salt and light. Send us forth into this world to be those evangelists of the truth of your holy will and holy word and your marvelous saving love. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And God be with you till we meet again. sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Beneath his wings protecting hide you. Daily manna still provide you. And God be with you till we meet again. Peace to love and serve the Lord.